Our scripture is coming from Luke chapter number 10, verses number 1 through verse number 3. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, the harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. If I had a task to do or a mission to complete, send me laborers. Well, I want people to go look at the job. We're not going to finish until the job is complete. But a worker is going to look at the hours and say, well, how long do we have to be here today? You see, a laborer shows up early and stays late. A worker shows up late and leaves early. You want more laborers. And ultimately, God says, I want laborers to come into my harvest field, not just workers. Because a worker is only going to go as far as the pay. If you get $8 an hour, $8 per hour, you'll learn how to work for $8 an hour. You'll learn how to work up to $8. You, somehow you'll just gauge yourself that you know just how much is required of you to make that $8. And when the clock strikes, it's time to go. That's a worker. But a laborer is not going to leave until the work is complete. So when God says, pray, that he sends more laborers. We go to Mexico, we want laborers on our mission trips. We don't want workers. We want laborers. I look at Walter. Walter's a laborer. If I, if I got a job to do, I want Walter. Walter's my first recruit. You're my first recruit now, all right? You got that. I'm calling Walter because Walter shows up early. And he's not leaving until the work is done. I say, Walter, it's dark. I know, but we got more stuff to do. We got to get this done. That's a laborer. Work will wear you out. Find a job that you love. If you love something, you'll labor at what you love. And if you love something, you'll never work a day in your life because the labor is what supplies you. Labor is it means it's a product. Labor also implies deliverance when you labor. If anybody's ever witnessed labor, if you mothers have been in labor, you know it's work, isn't it? It's work. Yes, from all sides. I, Kim, we, with five children, we, we, we know a little bit about labor. Kim's been through this five times and all... All home births, two underwater. Isn't that something? That's three underwater. Okay, it's correction. I'm sorry. Three underwater. Now, as Kim is laboring, I'm there. Again, it's called husband coached childbirth. So I'm there, right there. So as she's pushing and contracting, I'm contracting too. You know, I'm right there with her. You know, and she, okay, baby, come on. Now, push, breathe. Okay, good, good. All right. Now, but she's the one laboring. Now, here's the difference. Once, once this baby comes forth from the liver, Kim's ready to go. She's up. She's good. It takes me three days to get back right again. <laughs> because work wears you out. When you're laboring, you expect a harvest. That's a fruit. That's a deliverance point of your labor. When you're working for somebody else, you're working in someone else's field. That's when you're working. That means it's always someone else's field. If you're a worker, you're working in someone else's field. You get that? You may be in the medical field, legal field, business field, or whatever it is, you have a career field. And when you work in that field, you don't get to benefit from the harvest that you're producing. That's you, a worker. But when you're a laborer, it's your harvest field. And God says, pray that the Lord of the harvest send more laborers into his field. As a laborer, you know that everything you do, you do as unto the Lord. Isn't that right? I don't, if you sweep, you're sweeping as unto the Lord. Whatever you do, you're doing it as unto the Lord and not unto men. And your labor in the Lord is never in vain. God always rewards the laborers. Because the laborer is not going to stop until the work is done. And the harvest field that God is talking about is souls that need to be delivered. That's what God wants. Laborers are not going to finish until souls are saved. A work will stop as soon as the end of the day. But a laborer, well, we're not done because somebody, somebody needs to be saved. We're not going to finish until some souls are being saved. Somebody needs to be delivered. And with labor, there is deliverance. With that birth, 
That means there's new life, there's a deliverance that's happening. You, a new birth is coming forth. If you are a laborer, that means that you have been delivered. God has delivered you from something. And as you have been delivered, you want to go out and find somebody else that you can help to be delivered. We're just beggars telling other beggars where they can find bread. See, the same way that God brought you out of darkness and into the light, you're going back into the darkness, but you want to help find somebody and bring them into God's marvelous light. That's what a laborer is. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And that's what ultimately laborers do is try to find someone to deliver from evil. The harvest field of those who's ripe for deliverance. And we need laborers who's not going to stop until somebody gets saved. You're not stopping until that coworker, that friend, that neighbor of yours, that enemy of yours even are saved. Because one way to get rid of an enemy is to make them a friend, right? One way to get rid of a sinner is to save them. And through God's salvation, it changes a life. And ultimately, God's going to use you. He's using you to change that life. The people around you, and I know they annoy you. I know there's people that's hard to be around. But they need you. They, they need only what Jesus can provide through you. And you will be the conduit to change that life. But you cannot become weary in well-doing. Because as a laborer, you're not going to stop. That's your mission field. God sends you out. He says, as sheep among wolves. But God is your protection as you go out. You have to worry about the people around you and the harm that can come to you. God has you in the palm of his hand. He has a hedge of protection around you. And he protects you from all evil. But we've got to be willing to labor. As you know, with labor comes labor of pains, right? There's going to be a painful process as you're laboring for the Lord. It's not always going to be easy. Being a Christian is difficult. In fact, it's impossible. But with God... That's the difference. See, it's impossible for us. You cannot work hard enough and do well enough. It's impossible. Don't label yourself with trying to do it by yourself. You need God. First Corinthians 15 and 58 says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Your labor is not in vain. Labor also implies a due date. When you're laboring, there's a due date. There's a point when you're going to deliver. When you're laboring, God has a date. In due season, you shall reap. But you've got to hold on through all those other seasons until the due season. God knows where you are. God knows who you are. He has not forgotten about you. But in due season, if you continue, if you just continue and do not become weary, in due season, you shall reap. You have a due date. Whatever you're going through, there's a due date. It won't last always. God will deliver you from whatever it is. There's a due date. You just may not be due yet. God uses ordinary people, and I'm, I, I'm glad God does that. God uses ordinary people like you and me. There's nothing special about any of us. There's nothing special about us. But God will take the ordinary and do what is extraordinary. Take the usual and make you unusual. The thing is, we try to fit in with the norm. Even norm is not with the norm anymore. God even saved norm. And if God can save norm, God can save us. But don't try to fit in. God doesn't call us to be a duplicate of somebody else. You are a designer's original. God made you special. God could have made you a copy of somebody else, but God made you unique. You are you. God looked at you and made you exactly the way he wanted you to be. You are perfect in God's eyes. Even what you perceive to be flaws are perfect. Oh, your head may be a little pointed. Your eyes may be a little narrow. Your nose is too big. Your lips are too narrow. But God looks at you and God it sees you are, you are the living vision of perfection. And when you look in the mirror, you're looking into the face of God. Because we have been created in God's image and God's likeness. Don't let anybody talk you down. Don't talk yourself down. You are God's favorite. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on his refrigerator. 
You are God's favorite. Did you know that? Who says God can have just one favorite? He's God. He's God. You are God's favorite. The people that God chose, the 12 disciples, and here the scripture says he sent out 72. He sent out 12 before, but he sent out 72 others. And there was nothing special about who God chooses. There's not your qualification that God says, I gotta choose somebody that's qualified. God does not call the qualified. He what? Qualifies the called. So don't feel that you measure up, I, I can't do it, I'm not good at that. God says, I, I just want someone who's willing and obedient. If you were just willing to say, here am I, God, use me. God will take care of all that stuff. And you'll be amazed what God would do with you. You'll say, man, I didn't know I was that good. You weren't that good. It's when God got hold of you, God started bringing stuff out of you that you didn't even know that you had. You didn't know you could sing that well, that you were that smart or that talented. But when God takes you, God takes the hidden treasure that he has put in deep in us. And he brings out of us the gift that he has placed in us. And I submit that all of us have gifts that we have not opened yet. Your best is still yet to come. The more you surrender yourself to God, the more God can bring out in you what he has hidden from the devil. See, if, if, if God put your gifts and your treasures where it was visible to you, it would be too plain and too common. You would forsake it. Everything that God values, God hides. Gold, deep. Pearls are deep in the ocean. Jewels, diamonds are deep in mines. Oil, you have to dig down deep and you don't strike it every time you dig. You have gifts that's so deep within you and the more you go into God, the deeper you go into God, the more it reveals who God is in you. That's why your best is not found in you and your education or your vocation. Your best is found in God. When you get deep enough in him, he starts revealing to you the real, true, and essence of who he made you to be. I could never have done this in my own strength, in my own power. There's no way I could ever do this. But the more I submit myself to God, the more God brings out more and more in me. My best is yet to come. Better look out. Your best is yet to come. Your best is yet to come. And one of the things that God gives you oftentimes as you're working and being with him is the favor. And favor is a presence of God that you feel that I cannot explain. But when the favor of God is on you, you walk differently. There's a whole different understanding. Your status changes when God's favor is on you. You know that you're somebody special. You're a child of the most high God. You're a king's kid. That's the favor of God. You know, when they brought slaves over here from Africa, the most difficult slaves to try and indoctrinate into slavery were the ones that were the kings and queens, sons of kings and queens in Africa. Those are the most difficult slaves because they already understood the only person they bow to is the king. And even though they may have captured him, he's still the child of the king. And though Satan may come upon you and oppress you as much, you know you're still a child of the most high God. You're the king's kid. And you're not going to submit to anyone else except the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That's what it means to be a child of God. When his favor is on you, you understand that you walk into a new identity. Same person you always have been, but now your identity and your status changes. You recognize who you always have been. You're the one. You're the one that God called. He could have called anybody, but he chose you. And before you were born, before the beginning of time, God had a place carved out in this world for you. He formed you before you were in your mother's womb. He called you. So you have a place right now in this world that God called specifically for you. And if you don't do what God called you to do, it won't get done. You have to realize that the place that God has for you is for you. Your destiny lies not in your hands. It lies in God's hands. So God uses ordinary people. Your qualifications are not important to God. God doesn't say, I need a good doctor. I need a good whatever. I need this. God just calls people. And God will use you to do what God wants you to do. 
There's enough work for everyone. There's enough work for everybody. Did you know? Romans 12 and 4, for as we have for as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. It's like an orchestra. You may have two playing the same instrument, but in order for this orchestra to sound the way it needs to sound, it, it needs all of them. And having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Whatever you've got, you've got to use the gift. If you have an instrument to play, you've got to play that instrument. You can say, well, they already got a guitar player. Oh, they already got that. Oh, they already got that. But, they, but what's missing is you. Amen. When you see something missing in our church, you say, oh, something is missing. I don't know what it is, but something is missing. Every time you show up, something is missing. Huh? Guess what that one thing that's missing is? Is you. Amen. We're looking around for the answer. The answer is you, right? Don't blame the world about what's missing when we're not adding to and trying to be the solution to what the world needs. Because the solution may just be in you. So if you have the gift of prophecy, then prophesy. If you have a gift of teaching, then teach. If you have the gift of ministering, then minister. If you have the gift of ushering, then ush. <laughs> if you have the gift of being a deacon, then deek. Whatever you do, do what God's given you to do. Because if you don't do it, something is missing. So, and that one thing that is missing is probably you. And we can complain about something being missing and knowing that the one thing that's missing is, is really us. And if we would just add that one element, it makes everything work. My mother used to prepare dishes. My mother was a wonderful cook. But every once in a while, mom would have an ingredient that she just didn't have at the time. You know, that didn't have this, so she wouldn't add it. She didn't have nutmeg or cinnamon or whatever. And she would try to serve it. We'd go like, mama, this tastes funny, you know? We didn't know what it was, but we knew that something was missing, right? And you, don't, you might not know what it is, but you know when something is missing. So when something is missing, you have to search yourself, examine yourself. It's what's missing. It's what God is trying to prompt you to do. Because you could be that one element that can change everything. And you do what you do. God will bless you for it. Don't try to make money. Try to make a difference. Try to make a difference. If you just do your best to make a difference, God will make sure everything else comes to you. That's called seeking him first. If you're seeking God, you want to make a difference. You want to impact lives. And if you seek first the kingdom of God, if you seek him in all of his righteousness, then he says all of these what? All these things will be added to you. But the priority has to be God over things. We seek things first. Then we seek God after we get the things. We make enough. We do enough. We got enough. Then I'll do this after I get the things taken care of. God says, if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't have things. Even the thing that you have, you can bless God for it. But God's the one that gives. He's the giver of every good and every perfect gift. There's no unemployment or disability in God, in case you're wondering that. God, I can't do it, Pastor, because I got a bad hip. You know, my hip bothered me, so I can't do it today. God will use you with bad hip, no hip, whatever, bad knees. God will use you. There's no disability. There's no impairment. There's no retirement when it comes to God. The only way that we retire is when, when they have laid you to rest, uh, when Jesus comes. But there's still plenty of work for everybody here to do. He wants laborers, not workers. Not people who's going to show up and say, well, how often do I have to do this? I can't do this, but once a while. No, no, that's, not, that's a worker mentality. A laborer says, I will do whatever you want me to do. God, whenever you want me to do it, I will go wherever you want me to go with whoever you want me to be with. God, I go, but don't send me with Ethel. No, 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 I don't want to go to her. I don't want to go with him. Don't, don't, don't send me with that crowd. No, you, God, here am I. Use me. That's a servant's heart. We didn't have a servant's heart. Because we come to serve, not to be served. That's a servant's heart. We come to serve, and we can't serve enough when it comes to God. Don't try to do the work alone. Uh, you need people, Right? People who need people <laughs> are the happiest people in the world. 
And some of us don't realize that you've struggled more alone. Your greatest struggles have been when you've been alone. You, you've done your, and a lot of people are alone a lot of times, and Satan wants to isolate you, and he will beat you down when he isolates you. You need people. You're not as far as you can be right now because you didn't have people with you that God was trying to send to you. Now, you may have had people, but they could be the wrong people because people can be different. Uh, now, they come in all shades and all, all grades, but you want God to send me the right people. That means that you can't just choose someone and ask God to bless what you chose. You have to wait until God chooses for you. Because sometimes we make a choice and say, God, now bless this mess. Hmm? Okay, God, bless this mess. I know, I know God bless this mess. See, if we would just be patient, God has the right choice. But he's trying to bring it to the right person. You get it? He's trying to bring the choice to the right person. And if you're not the right person, you're not ready to receive what God has for you. Because we can pray and not be worthy to receive what God is trying to get to us. Remember, things don't come to us, they come from us, remember? We're the measure by what's come to us. When we're at a low point and we're not trying to honor God, low things come, right? When we're in dark places, dark things happen in dark places. And when you try to pray God into the darkness, God's trying to move you into the light. But we've got to pray, God, bring, help me to move into the place where I can be at the point where I can receive what you have for me. Because sometimes what's hindering us is us. We want God to just bring it, but if we're not prepared for what God is trying to bring, we'll mess it up. You believe that? If you're not ready to receive what God has for you, you'll get and you'll mess it up. Now, you may have been one of those kids that broke every toy you ever got in, in, in record time. How quick can you break the toy? You know, you have a toy, just Christmas Day, by, by Christmas Eve, you already broke the toy. But when you can receive something, you care for it differently. It lasts longer. You're more mindful about how you handle something because you're ready to receive it. But if you always are breaking things, if your history has always been to get something and break it, always are breaking something, then you've got to work on how you're managing what you're uh, allowed to receive. Because when you manage things well, better things start coming to you. When you haven't taken care of what God's given you, how are you going to do with the new thing God has for you? If you not handle what you already have and been a good manager and a good steward over that, then how are you going to manage something different? Right? Because different only means different. Different doesn't mean better. New doesn't mean better. It only means new. Better means better. You can get better where you are right now. You can get new where you are right now. It's not something else that has to be new. New is a new attitude first. A new perspective. A new insight. And once that changes, guess what? Everything old becomes new. If you see it from God's vantage point, new is trying to get to you, but new has to come from within. Beauty is in the eye of what? The beholder. It's not what you see that's beautiful. It's the beauty in you that allows you to see things, and everything becomes beautiful based upon your perspective for it. You've had something that you used to didn't like, and because you've changed, you go back and you like it now. Why is that? Because the, the source of things has changed. As you change, so does your world around you change. As you change, so does people around you change. You want that to change. And no matter how much that changes, it can't change you. Have you noticed that? All kinds of things can change, but if you're the same, you just recreate the old issues, the old attitude in wherever you are. New job, but you'll recreate everybody that was in your old job at your new job. Okay, you're the person that does this. You'll recreate everything and have the same old Though this is new, God created me a new, clean heart. Create the right spirit in me. That's what David said. When David searched himself, he says, God, I know it's me. Against you only have I sinned. Pray that God create the right spirit in you. God created me a new heart. Take out this heart of stone and give me a heart of flesh. And when God starts changing things, it starts with you. Don't pray that God changes anything else until God finishes the work in you. And I promise you, if you just let God do the work in you, he'll be working on us until Jesus comes. We won't have time to look at anybody else. 
Because our sins are many, right? God can stay busy just with Gene. I know you got him, but he can work on me for a while. You know? He's got enough stuff he's working on just with me and just with you. That you don't have to look at somebody else and say, God, fix them. We are all a work in progress, right? We are all a work in progress. So don't try to do it alone. Hebrews 10 and 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. This is great. Building each other up so much more as you see the day approaching. Build up people around you. Be an encourager. Be an exhorter. Try and find a way to make good happen when things are around you. Well, I'm kind of a loner. How's that working for you? <laughs> Remember, your worst things has happened probably when you were alone. The, the worst damage is the damage we do to ourselves. There's some people around you that can help you to get a different perspective. They can share things with you that can lead you in a different direction. You need people. You need a team of people around you. We talk about our birth team. When Kim, we had our births, and that would usually be the, the, the midwife, myself, and maybe somebody else that we would invite to the birth. But we wanted somebody to be invited that can, that can add value to what we're doing. Not someone that's concerned all the time. Ooh, whoa, what do we do now? Oh, you know, we don't want anybody that's going to panic. You want people around you that's going to give you some encouraging words. Like, whoa, you messed up. Oh, no, you want somebody that's going to try and shed light and try to be be somehow a comfort to you and give you bright counsel. You don't need people to say, I don't know, but I'm out of here. <laughs> you want people that's going to go the last mile with you, right? You want to look around and say, where did he go? Man, he's gone. No. Mm -mm. And lastly, in Exodus, here's why you need people. The Bible says that Moses was on the mountain. And they were fighting a battle. And Moses had his hands lifted up. And as long as Moses' hands were lifted up, they were victorious in battle. But what happened is Moses started getting tired. And when he started to get tired, his hands began to drop. And as he began to drop his hands, they began to lose the battle. See, your battle is in your praise. As long as your hands are lifted up, you will find out that no weapon forged against you will prosper. Keep your hands lifted up. Keep your faith lifted up. When you start to become discouraged, you begin to drop your praise. You begin to drop your hands. You begin to doubt God. But what Moses had was Aaron on one side and her was on the other side. And when they saw that Moses started getting weary, they grabbed his hands and they grabbed and they lifted his hands up. And though Moses was weary, there were people around him that kept him lifted up. And when you become weary, you need people around you that's going to keep you lifted up in prayer. I know you're struggling. I pray for everyone. If God brings you to my mind, I'm praying for you. I'm lifting you up in prayer. I know you're tired sometimes, but believe me that you're being lifted up. And if there are people around you that's lifting you up, you cannot be weary as long as somebody around you lifts up. You need people. You need a team of people around you. That's why the scripture says, confess your sins one to another, that you may be healed. You need people around you that when you're tired, you just call them and say, don't worry about it. I'll be right there. I'm right there with you. And they're going to come and sit with you and they're going to lift you up. Don't suffer alone. We're so good at suffering silently. Nobody ever hears our cry. Nobody ever knows what we're going through, but God gives you people. If you would just use people and the resource that God gave you, that when you're weary, he'll lift your hands. I've got people around here I call on. I don't, you don't know when I've called you sometimes. I've just called to chat with you, but I've called you because I know that you're going to lift me up. Sometimes even pastors get tired. And whatever you're doing, you get tired, and you're going to need to be lifted up. That's why we need people. And that's why we have to labor in this battlefield. And it is a battlefield. We labor one to another. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send more laborers. The harvest is truly great and plentiful, but the laborers are few. I don't know about you, but when I look out, I see laborers. I see people who's willing to go the extra mile, who's willing to show up early and stay late, who's willing to stay until the work is done. 